As I raced to beat winter and finish my camp house shed project, I found myself needing to complete a very important milestone, getting this thing waterproof. But before we can do that, we've got a porch to build and a roof to sheath. Time is ticking, and with rain on the forecast, I need to finish. That is, of course, unless working alone doesn't kill me first. Last night was the first time that it rained since starting this project, which highlights an important milestone that I need to get to, which is to make this thing waterproof. But before we do that, we gotta add some more framing details, like framing out the end of each side of the shed, which is gonna have a small little window up top, and adding some details on the transom part, which is gonna allow me to put sheathing on both the sides and the top. Let's get those knocked out first, then maybe we can start closing this thing in. Now, technically, this little bit of framing isn't needed for any kind of structural strength since the trusses are bearing all of the load. However, this middle section should make it a little bit more stout, but the main purpose of it is just to frame out the small 12 by 12 window and provide a place to nail the OSB sheathing later. Those small two by fours close to each end are purely there for that purpose only. All right, we've got both end walls fully framed out with that little picture window kind of up in the center on both sides. I'm sure the edited footage made it look like I did that in like 10 minutes, but it was more like two hours. Anytime you're up on a ladder, it just totally slows down. And then you add on top of that, the fact that I'm filming it and it's a disaster. Okay, the next order of business is really to fix a mistake on my part when I was laying out the trusses up on top in this transom section. I should have had a truss sort of combination on each end and then spaced them in between there. But instead I kind of left myself with kind of like an eight inch overhang on each side, which now I'm gonna have to go frame out just so I can secure OSB and make it look nice and tidy. If I were gonna tell you how to do this, I would not do it like that. But for my purposes, I'm just gonna have to do a little bit more work and we'll be okay. All right, so let's go get both sides framed out and then maybe we can move on to some sheathing. So to fix this, I kind of have to make two half trusses that I'll just have to tie into the existing full truss next to the opening. And since I'm going to have to attach it to the top truss plate, I needed to build out one side with some scrap half inch plywood so that there was a flush surface to nail the OSB to. These plywood pieces are essentially just a spacer. I can then put them into position and secure in place with nails, followed by some blocking to the adjacent truss for some added stability. And as many people pointed out in the last video, nailing towards your face is a terrible idea. Don't do this. Now I can add the backing board, at least that's what I'm calling it, to create a lip that I can both reference to and nail the sheathing to later. If this is kind of hard to imagine, just wait until later in the video and it'll make sense. Okay, now I think we're at a point where we can start adding some sheathing. Now, if you're building something like this, you'll kind of find out that it's still a little wobbly. You can certainly move the whole structure. Once you add sheathing, that adds a ton of strength. It keeps all the walls from shearing. It's just gonna stiffen it up a lot. Now, I'm not gonna add sheathing to everything, and the order that I'm doing things might seem kind of weird, but I'm gonna start by sheathing both end walls because the soffit ladders we're gonna make for each gable are gonna attach on top of the sheathing, which it'll just make sense once we get there. I'm also gonna start sheathing the front wall because I can, I'm not really waiting on anything. The back wall I'm going to leave open and you'll see why later in the video. Also, I finally set up a miter saw stand, but it was after I was done framing. Typically you do this the other way around. You'd want to set it up and then do your framing. I'll still get to use it for plenty of things, but it would have been really nice to have when I was cutting all those two by fours on that floppy table over there. Nice. Now the really cool part about this camp house shed being tucked away in this back corner is that it will be secluded. The bad part, hauling material, especially what will be 36 sheets of half inch OSB. Now maybe this isn't the most elegant way to do this, but to get the first panel straight, I'm piling up what is essentially garbage on the ground until it's pretty close and then I can fire in a couple of nails. I did try to leave a small gap between the slab and the bottom of the OSB around the perimeter of the shed as best I could. Now for the long walls, I made sure this bottom row of sheathing was level so that the next rows could reference directly off of them. and of course, staggering seams of the panels for maximum strength. For those curious, yes, I attempted to leave about an eighth inch gap between all the sheets to allow for some expansion. However, I'll admit some were a little bit tighter than others. So, guess we'll see. Now the angled cuts on the eaves were a little tricky to lay out. I was so focused on being accurate that I completely missed the fact that I was cutting from the wrong side of the OSB. Yeah, without those very handy nailing reference lines, which are now facing inside the shed. I will say, I did nail the shape though. It was a nice fit. And here's the price you pay without having those nice reference lines. Up and down the ladder to check stud locations. Oh boy. 
And finally, this odd shaped piece at the top, since, you know, I made this end truss backwards and the truss plate is on the outside. I told you it'll be okay. And then of course, just doing the exact same thing on the opposite side of the shed. Now to cut out the window and door openings that we just covered up. I started by drilling a half inch hole at each corner to reference from from the outside, and then attempted to cut those openings out a couple of different ways. The first way was with a templating bit in my little trim router. Though it was accurate and left a very clean opening, it was by far the slowest and messiest method. I probably should have also used a full size router because this poor little guy would get bogged down in the OSB quite often. For the next method, I started by laying out some reference lines, connecting all the holes with a straight edge. Then I took my reciprocating saw and buzzed out the opening. Definitely a lot faster and less messy, but it left a pretty sloppy cut line. Now finally for the door, I tried a circular saw for the long runs, the reciprocating saw for the short runs and to clean up the corners, and then finally a final pass with the trim router to clean up the opening. Now I like this method best, and I know there's gonna be some out there saying, dude, you're just roughing it at this point. Doesn't need to be pretty, which I totally get, but I also just want it to look nice. After getting all of the openings cut, we can move on to the next step. But first, let's talk real quick about Craig Tool, who's a sponsor of today's video. Now, if you do any amount of do-it-yourself, chances are you've heard of Craig Tool, but maybe you've just heard of some of their products, like their really popular pocket hole jigs or the cabinet hardware mounting jigs. You might think that Craig just caters to woodworkers, but the truth is that they've got a whole range of cutting, clamping, and work holding solutions that fit right at home on a job site like this. For example, they've got several solutions for ripping down sheet goods. Now, one of my personal favorites is my Craig track saw, which I used a ton to rip down the OSB for the siding on this shed. But they've also got a really handy tool called the rip cut. Now, the rip cut attaches to your circuit saw and essentially makes it an edge guided mini track saw. With a cutting capacity of up to 24 inches, I found it super useful when I needed to cut strips of the OSB and I didn't want to stop and move my track with my track saw. I was also really surprised by how small of a strip you can safely and accurately cut using that system. And it's not just cutting sheet goods either, it's also transporting them. So as you probably saw, I have quite a walk from where I park my truck to where I'm building this shed. So instead of traditionally carrying them and hurting my neck and back, I'm a huge fan of the Craig panel carrier, which allows me to pretty comfortably carry up to two panels of this OSB at a time, which saves me a ton of time. Now this is quite possibly the best $20 tool you can spend on a job site like this. And really the list goes on. If you're curious to learn more, go to craigtool.com and check out what they have to offer. I'm gonna put links down to all the products I'm using in this project as well as my favorites if you wanna go check those out. Big thanks to Craig Tool for helping DIYers and makers like us, and of course for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to it. So the order in which I do the next couple things may not make a lot of sense right off the bat, but I promise there's a method to my madness. The first thing we're gonna do is put on the subfascia along this back wall, and to do that, I made these two brackets that I'm gonna temporarily put in place underneath a couple of the rafters just to help me hold this big long two by four, again, because I'm working by myself. Yet another example of the ladder dance when working by yourself. The sheer number of times I've gone up and down a ladder is mind boggling at this point. Talk about a workout. You can see one of the reasons why I left the sheathing off on the back is because I knew getting to that was going to be kind of a challenge. Now with that done, let's move on to the soffit ladders. And for those who don't know, soffit ladder is just fancy carpenter talk for the overhangy bit on the end of the roof. Now my design calls for a 12 inch overhang on each side of the shed, so I need to build basically a set of soffit ladders for both sides. And this is actually why I elected to put the sheathing on each side first, because the soffit ladder is actually going to sandwich the OSB between the truss inside and the soffit ladder outside. You can see why having the subfascia board here is helpful. I also temporarily screwed in a scrap to the bottom to create a little lip that one side of the soffit ladder can rest on. And after getting the top edge flush with the rest of the trusses, I can temporarily secure in place with either a clamp or by driving in some screws. The other side, however, is a little trickier since I don't have anything to rest the bottom edge on, but with enough sweat and cuss words, it goes into place. And as you can tell, putting those up by myself was 
fun. Of course, after everything was positioned well, I secured everything in place with a ton of nails going through the OSB into the truss behind it. And now that that's done, I wanna put in the soffit underneath this back eave. Now I know it seems like a weird time to do this, but because I don't have a lot of access, especially once the sheathing is up, I might as well get it done now. And then once that's up, we can finally get the sheathing put on this back wall. And because we're going a little bit extra on this shed for the soffit, I'm gonna use this quarter inch thick tongue and groove planking. Now I found this in one of the big box stores, and I think it frankly is gonna work out really well for a soffit because it's really not doing anything but being decorative and maybe keeping out birds. And this stuff is a heck of a lot cheaper than the traditional tongue and groove siding I was going to use. So let's get it cut down, put it in place. These little planks are three and a half inches wide and I start on the inside edge and work my way out. I'm securing these in place with some one and a quarter inch galvanized finish nails. You can see how tight it would be to nail this thing if the sheathing was in place. Now I would love to take credit for planning it out like this. But this little eave was exactly two planks wide, so I don't need to rip anything down to fit. And once we put our final fascia board up, it's going to cover up this edge really nice. Alright, with that out of the way, let's finally get some sheathing on this back wall. Now that that back wall detail is done, we're gonna move on to the front porch. Now my goal in this video is to get all the sheathing on, including the roof. And the only thing holding us up from doing that really is the porch itself. So to get that built, I've gotta put in the posts, the beam, and then build the overhang, and then figure out all of the framing details to kind of tie everything together. Now, as we all know, my foundation isn't square. So when laying out these post locations, I'm ultimately going off the shed, not the concrete. The post brackets I'm using are from Simpson Strong Tie, and they have a single anchor bolt going through the center with this cover that goes over the nut. And I'm just using the same 3 8 expanding anchor bolts that I did for the walls for these post brackets. But since I'm confined to the height of that little cover, I need to cut off the top of the stud. I chose a hacksaw instead of my reciprocating saw because I figured there was less of a chance to screw up the threads. Then to clean up after the cut, I just made a finish pass with my 3 8 die, which took off any burrs that were left from the saw. Now my plan is to set one post in place, cut it to the correct height, and then transfer that top surface to the other posts so I can make those cuts. Because there is no way I'm trusting this foundation to be level. To do this, I'm using a string and a level to create a reference mark across both of the other posts, after getting them plumb as well. Once those were cut, I realized I needed to finish sheathing the front face of the shed. Now, I previously left it open because I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to tie in the porch, but I think I came up with an easy way to do it. I figured I would just use some joist hangers that will tie directly into the top plates of the shed. So after snapping a level line, I got to work laying out these joist hangers 24 inches on center, plus a bonus one at each end to be flush with the edge of the top beam. And with those hangers in place, we're one step closer to addressing the porch, which is frankly a part that I've been trying to avoid because I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work. You see, not to bore you too many details, but I had to pre-order my metal roofing. Normally when you build something like this, you'd build it, take all your measurements, and then go order your roofing if you're doing something like a metal roof. But because the lead time was three plus weeks for the metal roof, I had to go with what my original design was. So I'm kind of constrained with that transition fitting the roof pieces that I ordered. Now worst case, I can just cut them down. I don't really want to do that, which is why I'm worried about the transition. Now I get these posts actually put in place now that they're cut down, put the top beams on, and start cutting those support. Can somebody help me? What are those called? I'll make it pop up on the screen right here. Those things are going to tie into this beam situation and lock it all into place. Clear as mud? Yeah, me too. Getting these posts and beams cut straight and mounted was kind of making my head spin. So I figured I would just lay them on the ground and temporarily attach them with some plates and then stand it up kind of like a wall. This barely worked, but it did work. And after wrestling them into the bracket and supported, I worked on getting everything nice and plumb again. Then I can move on to cutting the rafters. I calculated the length that I need, I think, that's gonna work with the size metal panels that I already ordered, and then laid out the bird's mouth. This little porch ended up having an 11 degree slope, in case you were curious. And with the layout established, I can get to work batching out a total of 10 rafters, always making sure to trace from my template rafter so I don't compound any errors and end up with some wonky cuts later. Then I took a couple of those rafters and secured them in place to kind of lock the posts and beams in their position. Once that was done, I drilled out the bottom holes in the bottom of the posts and secured them to the brackets with two 3 8 by 45 inch bolts at each connection. And at that point, I could attach my extremely overpriced decorative brackets and screws. But hey, at least it looks cool, right?
Now moving right along, I got the subfascia board attached to the front face of the porch. Now I'll admit, in my rush to get this thing finished, I realized that I accidentally let the center of the subfascia dip in the middle. Luckily, this will be hidden by the fascia that goes over it, and that dip isn't present in the actual roof rafters themselves. Now for the transition that I've been dreading, it actually wasn't very hard. These little transition blocks tie into both the top plates and a rafter and carry down the roof pitch onto the porch. And since the transition under the transom dormer was so small, I made up some blocks and attached them along a string line, and then added kind of a ledger between them to provide the strong anchor point for the sheathing. This little transition strip is only going to be about 7 inches wide. And then finally added some cheap insurance with these brackets on the roof rafters. To finish off the porch, I tied in the soffit ladders on each end with this small extension. Now I know that these corners are going to be very weak, and I just kind of know not to walk on them. I just got to make sure no one else walks on them. And for the opposite side, I could see that the soffit ladder was sagging a bit at the outside corner. So I got a chance to use a very useful tool, the jack clamp. By using it in its pushing mode, I was able to create some leverage and lift up that corner enough to drive in some nails. A very handy tool, really recommend them, they're American made. I'll have these linked down below if you want to go check them out. The last bit of framing is the small roof overhang on each end of the shed. There'll be one above the roll-up door, and one on the opposite side, where the eventual firewood storage is going to go. I just created a simple 15 degree slope roof here, and mounted directly into the studs on the wall. These will get some decorative supports later after we add the siding. So as of filming this right now, it is the end of the day on Monday, and I just checked the weather forecast. We're supposed to get rain on Wednesday. So I'm officially in a mad dash to get this thing waterproof ahead of the rain. But after everything we got done today, we're now officially ready for roof sheathing, which I can then waterproof and then wrap the sides. So I'm under no illusion I'm gonna get the roof on before Wednesday, but I will get it waterproof before Wednesday. So help me God. Also, I gotta say, I'm really digging how this thing is looking with the porch in place. It's starting to really look like a camp house, which is, again, what I've been going for this whole time. Now, the last couple little things I need to do is buzz out the rest of the windows. I've got the two transom up top, I've got these three transom in the back, and then one picture window on each end. I'll get those cut out right before we wrap it, but tomorrow the main focus is really gonna be roof sheathing. And of course I'm doing this alone, which means it's gonna suck. So here I am, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, getting this first roof sheathing panel in place. I'm feeling good. It's gonna be a good productive day. I ate my Wheaties. I can just feel it. I, I Oh no. That's right, on the first panel in, I fudge a measurement number, meaning that this panel doesn't land on a rafter. And rather than ripping it off, I decided to just use my track saw to cut back to the nearest rafter and go from there. And it didn't take long to find yet another issue. Remember that saggy corner? Yeah, it's still sagging a little bit. To keep the roof nice and level, I had to throw in these spacers to make up the difference. It seemed like a good idea, and the fascia trim should hide it. The only place you might see is underneath of the soffit, but it is what it is. I have a pretty strict policy of sharing screw-ups because, I don't know about you, but I watch some YouTube videos of people making crazy stuff and I think, how did that all just go perfectly? They really didn't make a single mistake? I'm a firm believer that mess-ups make us better, so why not share them? Now to be honest, the front face of this roof sheathing wasn't too bad. The porch certainly made it easier, and I got all these panels up in a couple of hours. And it only took that long because I had to cut down every single one. Now when it came to the back side of the roof, that's a whole different story. You can see here how little grip I have on this 10-12 pitch roof with these shoes. And the whole back face is at that slope. And getting this full sheet up a ladder, oriented like this, proved to be kind of a boneheaded move. As the panel flopped over the top edge, it threw me off balance and I ended up bailing off the ladder, only to have this OSB guillotine chase me down. Now luckily I was alright, but man, what a wake up call to be more careful. Have I mentioned that doing this by yourself sucks yet in this video? You know I say that, but honestly I've had offers for help from everyone from friends and family all the way to complete strangers who just happen to live nearby. I sincerely appreciate the offers, but at this point I kind of look at this as a challenge that I need to overcome. I mean, heck, I've got this far. Might as well see it through, right? Okay, the last bit of side sheathing is on each side of the transom dormer, which is a totally ridiculous shape. Not a right angle on this thing. Kind of like my slab, come to think of it. At this point, I'm going full send. I'm just making cuts on the roof itself. Not the brightest, but it did save a lot of ladder time. Hopefully now that framing detail we did at the beginning makes more sense. 
These panels were rock solid after nailing them in place. All right, time is ticking. Now for the waterproof underlayment for the roof. This is a synthetic product and I bought it purely because it says grip right on the label. At this point, I'll take all the grip I can get. Working from the bottom and overlapping as I went, trying to think about how water would run down over the layers. For weird areas and transitions, I'm using this flashing tape. It kind of feels like the easy button for roofing jobs. Now this stuff isn't cheap, but it should really help keep things watertight. Let's talk about cost. As you know, I'm providing actual costs as we go, and for this framing and sheathing milestone, lumber was again the number one cost at $1,065. Next up was hardware and miscellaneous. Biggest chunks here were Tyvek wrap, underlayment, and decorative post and beam hardware. That total category spend was $498. And then finally, we have fasteners, and I spent $97. This brings the total sheathing and framing spend to $1,660, and our running project total to $6,132. After getting the roof covered, I started with the wrap on this top dormer. And then it dawned on me that I never went back and cut the window openings. Dang it. Realizing my time was up, I threw in the towel. I tried leaving the edges of all the underlayment long to cover as much as possible ahead of the rain. Obviously that'll all get trimmed later. Notice how I didn't have time to nail the bottom edge of this underlayment. That might come back to bite me. Whew, okay. Well, I don't know how well it's gonna show up on camera, but it is starting to get dark. It's the end of the day, which means that that is as waterproof as it's gonna get before the rain hits tomorrow. I got pretty much the whole roof covered except for one small strip on the back, and I ran out of that flashing tape, so there's a couple more areas I wanted to flash, but that's okay. And sorry if I didn't show you more of that process. As you can imagine, filming while working alone on a roof can be challenging. The front porch actually worked out to be kind of a nice addition because it was sort of a work platform to get to this front half of the roof. The back side of the roof was an absolute nightmare because it's at just the incline that you start to slip and I just felt like I was gonna die the entire time. One thing I did that helped me was I screwed in a two by four just to kind of use as like a foothold to rest my foot against. This both helped during sheathing and for that underlayment stuff. I'll be the first to admit my goal was a bit lofty in that I wanted to get everything wrapped and waterproof as well as get the whole roof sheathed all in one day. That just turned out to be a little too much for me. But we're gonna continue along in the next video, get this thing wrapped up, put on the roof and install the doors and the windows. And speaking of the roof, I'm going to do a metal roof, but I've never even put up shingles. Metal's easier than shingles, right? No. Oh boy. Thank you all so much for coming along with me on this journey. I really appreciate it. If you've got any comments on anything I did or want to give me some advice, feel free to leave those down in the comments and make sure you subscribe so you know when the next videos come out. We're making progress for sure, but there's a lot left to do. So I'll see you guys in the next video.